My name is Susie Aid. I am a Global Mental Health Program Manager for Google's data centers. And it is my great honor today to introduce our guest. We have Dr. Judith Orloff. She is a New York Times bestselling author of The Empath Survival Guide and Thriving as an Empath. She teaches readers how sensitive people can thrive in an insensitive world. She is a psychiatrist, an empath, and is on the UCLA psych psychiatric clinical faculty. She synthesizes the best of conventional medicine with cutting edge knowledge of intuition, empathy, and energy awareness. She believes in the future of medicine and innovative businesses integrating all of this wisdom to achieve total wellness. She also specializes in treating empaths and highly sensitive people in her private practice. And she does online sessions with people and businesses internationally. Her work has been featured in O Magazine, Forbes, Business Insider, CNN, The Today Show, BBC, NPR. Um, and Dr. Orloff also has a new book called Radical Empathy that will be released in 2022. So welcome, Judith. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here too. And I'd love to, to kick us off with, you know, the title of this talk today is Radical Empathy in the Workplace. So I'd love to start with what is Radical Empathy and why did you choose that as the title for your upcoming book? Well, radical empathy is something that goes beyond regular empathy. Regular empathy is your heart goes out to somebody, you have a feeling of love or feeling of appreciation for what they're going through, um, and you leave it at that. But radical empathy is more of a superpower. I believe that it can change the world. It's our ability to use our hearts to bypass our minds and our egos in order to look inside other people and to know how they're feeling and to understand their point of view, even if we don't like them, even if fill in the blank. It's about learning to come from your highest self, not just your ego. You know, Plato says that empathy is the most precious form of human knowledge and it requires us to suspend our egos and come from a higher place. And the reason this is so important is that if we just react with our egos and just react with our minds, look at what happened to the world doing that. In the workplace, we wanna bring our interactions to a much more loving, higher place in order to free ourselves so we're not stuck in resentments and grudges and anger. And so it helps us improve the workplace and improve everything, how we, interrelate with coworkers, you know, the energy in the, in the room, you know, it just helps everything. Mm, yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, I imagine some people are thinking like, how do you even develop radical empathy? Um, what, what would be some, some quick tips that we could tell people? How do you actually harness that within you? If you're not even sure that you presently have it? Yeah, well, you might not. I mean, you might have be a very empathic person and you feel like, you know, you're a caring person, um, which is the beginning. You no, know, but there are different kinds of empathy that people typically have. One is cognitive empathy, where you can empathize with someone with your mind, you know, in a very mental way. And usually if somebody is hurting, if you have a friend who's hurting, you come up with solutions. So it's a kind of a mental exercise. It's, it's nice, but it's limited. Or you can have emotional empathy, which is where your heart actually feels for another person. And everyone who's listening, just you could ask yourself, which type of empathy do I have now? And how can I maybe develop other forms of empathy? But emotional empathy is where your heart goes out to somebody else and you feel what they're going through, including their happiness. And then you have intuitive empathy where your intuition feels you know, connected to somebody else where you get a gut feeling about them or you get a sense of a vibe around them or you get a sense of this person feels right or doesn't feel right. It's something to honor. And then there's spiritual empathy where if, if, if you're on a spiritual path, it's wanting to come from a higher place, wanting to come from a place of compassion rather than resentment, it's their spiritual ideals. And some people who are oriented towards spirituality, and not everyone is, 
um, like to think of empathy in terms of that. So the first thing you can do is see what type of empathy that you have and begin to develop maybe the other types as well. And I want to say sometimes people are reluctant to develop empathy because they're so sensitive that they're afraid of going on empathy overwhelm, where if somebody, if they're, if you open up to somebody who's expressing their true feelings, that you might absorb it like an emotional sponge. As I'm a psychiatrist, I'm also an empath. And an empath is somebody who has it's kind of on the, the higher spectrum of empathy rather than the middle, which is your heart just goes out to somebody. An empath, and some of you might relate, is somebody who doesn't have the ordinary filters that others have to filter out stimuli from the environment. And so we tend to be emotional sponges who take on a lot of stuff in, in the workplace and, and everywhere else. And so sometimes people are reluctant to develop empathy because they don't want to experience empathy overload. And that's very common where you just, you don't know how to set a boundary. And that's one of the techniques we'll talk about. You don't know how to say no to people. You don't know how to cut it all off and even cut a conversation off. It's important for me as an empath and particularly working with patients, you know, to be able to have my boundaries be clear in my social life, be able to say no, or if a friend calls and going round and round and round with the same problems for two hours after I've had a long day to be able to say, you know, I love you, but I can only listen for a couple of minutes now because you're going around in circles and I'm tired. And if they say, oh, what kind of friend are you? You know, because that's what people are afraid of. Um, and they might say that. You say, I love you. I'm a good friend, but I'm really learning how to take care of myself. So when you are able to set boundaries in a loving way and firm and repetitive, then you're able to protect yourself more from empathy overload and it becomes more something that you want to gravitate towards because empathy feels wonderful. It's not something that hurts. It's something that expands you. And it's to be able to reach out to somebody and feel, let's say, an animal, to feel nature, to feel a coworker, you know, to be able to just see where they're coming from. You don't have to agree with them. But the reason this is so important is if you can make this one step that is not your ego, it's, a, it's another step, it frees you from getting so attached to being mad at them, to going round and round in your mind about this person, it detaches you from the person so that you can see them at a greater distance, understand where they're coming from. You might not agree with where they're coming from. And this is what's so hard for people. But it, it's, you know, like in India, when people meet people on the path, they say namaste. And namaste is, I respect the spirit within you. But that's all it means, which is a big scope. Of course, it's a beautiful thing, but it doesn't mean I agree with you. It doesn't mean I like you. It means I, you're human, just like me. Everybody's equal. And I respect the spirit within you. I might not choose to hang out with you. I might not choose to partner with you, but I can respect you. You see, that maybe is a leap for people because they're so used to resenting everybody when they do something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I just want to point out, we're all annoying. We're all irritating. You know, that's just the nature of being human. And so, you know, I'm not talking about predators or abusers here. I'm not, I'm talking about regular people you're working with. You know, the people who are sitting next to you, the people you're having meetings with, who, you know, might be irritating you or even insulting you on, on some level. But there's a different way of dealing with it other than, going home and seething, you know, or just going back to the next meeting, sending off horrible vibes, you know, negativity, because you're still in that place with them. But the magic is when you're able to say, hmm, I don't like this person, this person isn't listening to me, blah, 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 all the reasons. And you say, okay, but where are they coming from? And if you can open yourself up to that and you pick up, they're really insecure. They're really unhappy people, you know, or they're narcissistic people. They're not capable of empathy. You need to know that. And we can talk about that. Um, and you go, oh, 
okay. All right. My expectations are too high with this person. I don't want to keep getting hurt over and over again with them. So if you just ask yourself the question, that's all you have to do to begin. How can I have empathy for this person? And your ego might rise up and go, why would you want to do that? You know, but you, you respond and you go, I want to do that because I don't want to be stuck in this. And see, the ego is fine to keep you miserable. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't care. It wants to keep you miserable and stuck in resentments and grudges and who you don't like, who you do like. But empathy will release you from that even just taking the step, you know, a little step saying how, where is this person coming from, even though the ego doesn't like them. And then you'll experience with that a freedom. So you're not attached or controlled or disempowered by anybody. The point is you want to be in your power. Mm -hmm. You want to be in your power. You don't want to give your power away to anybody ever. And so being aware of empathy, being aware of your intuition, being aware of sensing energy and not getting overwhelmed, being able to take care of yourself in that way, um, in many ways. And we can talk about strategies for that. You know, can free you up and can make the workplace so much better. But it is asking you to make a shift. And it is asking you to think about why empathy might be important today. Yeah. And I want to go back to just the very first thing you said that like empathy is it's a superpower. And I want to just kind of ground folks in like why from an evolutionary standpoint do we have that superpower, that ability to feel into what other people are experiencing? Well, traditionally, it's been linked to child rearing and the oxytocin that is stimulated in the body, the love hormone, the bonding hormone that mainly women have, but men have a little bit of it. Um, But mainly in, in evolutionarily, the oxytocin would soar and it bonds the mothers and the babies and it bonds the other women at the fire. And so it's a bringing together hormone, it brings love and understanding and people together. When you're warm and fuzzy and feeling good, it's hard to be resentful of somebody. So yeah. that that's where it comes from. But then it extends, you know, to everybody because empathy in the workplace and empathy everywhere. You now the Dalai Lama, Plato, very spiritual thinkers have said empathy is the most precious form of human knowledge. Mm-hmm. And you think about that. Why is it we're not talking about it more? I know it's been mentioned, but it's not. How do you develop it? Why is it important to me? Why do I want to do it? You know, it's a healing for you. You know, I'm sure you've seen people or, you know, I certainly have relatives who were stuck in their resentments. They were wronged. Yes, they were wronged. It was horrible. But 30 years later, they're still talking about it. And they're telling their grandchildren about it. And it's a story that they've carried with them forever. That's not healthy for their system. Because when you have resentments or grudges, especially chronic, you have stress hormones rushing through your system all the time, which are increasing your blood pressure, decreasing your immunity, doing all kinds of problems with aging and well-being. And you don't want that. And what empathy does is stimulate the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic nervous system, which will calm you down, which will get you into the feeling of heart and openness to your fellow human being, which is something we need to do now. We need to figure out how to connect to our fellow human beings, as difficult as it might seem. And you open up and you begin to get the endorphins flowing, the feel-good hormones. You begin to get dopamine, the pleasure hormones. You can feel the shift in your body once you begin to shift from the stress hormone mode and fight, flight, or freeze mode into my heart is open. I can see what's happening. I don't feel threatened, and I know how to proceed with this. You see, it takes a little bit of um, practice. That's why radical empathy is how to do this. How do you do this And if you don't like somebody? How do you do this if you're hurting? How do you do this if you're going through anxiety or overwhelm? So it's true. We do need to be educated, 
but it's possible and it will improve everyone's lives and particularly your work lives at Google. You're so interested in wellness and taking it to the next level and not just perpetuating the kind of low consciousness patterns that are going on in our world. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, just I'm just thinking, thinking too. To, oh, sorry. Hold on. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Let me see. Um, so I, I was, I was thinking from the perspective of someone who's, just working, like a lot of us are, are working in this remote environment. Some folks are still going in and in the middle of a pandemic. What are those first signs that maybe we need to employ empathy either for ourselves or for somebody else? Like if, if, if you're thinking of someone who's completely unaware, um, but they know they're just, they're feeling anxious, they're not, something's off. What, what, are, what are those initial things that they should be looking for to know that they need to employ or deploy ra radical empathy? Great question. Um, you need to be able to begin to think about showing empathy for yourself and not beating yourself up the first thing you wake up in the morning. As I, I know as a psychiatrist working with people that nearly everybody beats themselves up a lot. You don't know what people are really doing in their own heads. Um, but Empathy is about saying to yourself, this has been a rough year. No, this has been scary for me. I've lost people. I'm not as close to my coworkers. We have no in-person interactions, if that's what you like. Um, and to be able to take the pressure off yourself first thing in the morning, first thing to say something nice to yourself, like, you know, you're showing up. You've been day at a time getting through this. You know, you're incredible. I'm going to do my work just what I have today to deal with. I'm not going to think about the future. So the first step towards self-empathy is taking the pressure off yourself in your own head. And all of you listening, you know what you're doing. And it's usually good to start first thing in the morning when you awaken to start with being kind to yourself and to start with... Um, not focusing on the person you don't like at work, but focusing on, you know, the, the beautiful flower next to you or somebody that you love. You know, focus on something where you could take control of your neurochemistry and create positive biochemicals rushing through your system from the beginning. And you can do that up here because if you don't, if the mind, body, spirit, connection we're all connected everything in you and your thoughts matter so having empathy with yourself it's harder than than people might think but it, it's like a shower of positive energy that you can give yourself so just beginning with that and just putting one foot in front of the other do not catastrophize about your future you know that's the antithesis of empathy that's just the active mind telling you stories about yourself. And if you're an empath and you're afraid you're going to be overwhelmed today, you know, begin to tell yourself, I can set boundaries. You know, I can say no. I can set limits. I'm not powerless. I'm not a victim here. I can stand up for myself. And I don't have to listen to everybody who tells me their life story. Because empaths in, in the workplace, it's like you wear an invisible sign and people flock to you. They flock to me everywhere. I, when I you know, used to fly a lot, I'd sit in the airport and people would just spot me and I'd be in my little bubble. They'd spot me and they'd come over and start telling me their whole life story. It happens all the time. So I have to put a limit on that so that I can have my private time. And I just say, you know, I kind of taking this time to myself right now. So even just that simple statement, just know all the empaths and sensitive people out there, you can do that in the workplace. And, you know, I just want to say in, in all workplaces, there are energy vampires or drainers in the workplace. That's just a reality. It's part of the mix. And learning how to deal with these people is essential so you're not disempowered. And how to deal with them involves identifying them, setting limits with them and knowing you have power over them rather than just feeling run over by all these people. Yeah. And uh, I mean, emotional contagion is very real. And so I'm curious, like, what are, 
what are some of the, the signs in which you know you're starting to experience emotions that aren't necessarily your own? And then you talked about creating some barriers or some other tactics. What do you do in those scenarios to really distinguish, this is me, that's them, and I, there I have some control over what I feel and it's not necessarily taking on what the other person is experiencing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, there's emotional contagion in the workplace. And what that means is that if somebody's feeling an anxious and if they come in and say, oh, I'm so afraid of losing my job to the group, that anxiety will spread through the whole group like a virus. And the same is true with positive emotions. We have somebody who's really optimistic and saying, we're going to have a great day. I love being with this team. Then all the positivity you know, is spread in the workplace. And so just know that what you say, how you say it, and your your the spirit with which you share it is very important because it will affect people. And particularly if, you, if you're an empath in the workplace, you know, you want to be able to you know, set the boundaries and take care of yourself. Um, and you know, one, one technique is learning how to visualize uh, a protective shield around yourself, like a bubble, um, just a, a bubble of integrity, of strength that keeps out anything negative. It's a visualization that's protective. It, you visualize it all around yourself so that no negative vibes can get in. And it really works. Um, and many therapists use this as a technique with difficult patients. Or if you're around just you know a totally negative situation and you have to stay there, it's a you know for, for the moment. And we can talk about you know why you don't want to be in too many of those. Um, but you can use this shielding technique that's very important. And remember to breathe as well because the breath allows you to let go of whatever anger or resentments or negative vibes are in the room is most people, what they do when they're in a situation like that is hold their breath. They're sitting there like this, clenched and holding their breath, which only keeps that energy in your body. Mm. All right, so how do you know if it's you or them, whether you're absorbing somebody else's emotions? This is a key to radical empathy. You have to know this. This is, a, this is the form of emotional intelligence that I'm talking about. And the way you know that is, if your mood suddenly changes, you know, let's say you came into work feeling good, then all of a sudden you're depressed, all right? And you were just talking to your fellow coworker. You have to ask yourself, was it something about what the coworker said or what their energy was like that caused me to go down, all right? You have to ask yourself those questions and you can assume that it's probably at least partly them. All right, and the same is true with with positivity. If you're if you come to work and your coworker is just filled with inspiration, you know, when you're listening to it, suddenly your energy level might go up, and you start feeling better than when you came in. Let's say you were tired, and now you feel uplifted. Now we can do that for one another in the workplace too. That's why it's so important to be aware of empathic communications with people by what vibes do you pick up where does my mood change does my energy change around somebody you know just ask yourself that and let's say you determine yes it's him or her <laughs> and that's okay i mean you want to know that and then you want to ask yourself what self-care strategies can i use in those situations is this just today with the person or is this person a chronic downer you know, and, you know, if it's a chronic downer, then you you need to develop some limits and boundaries with them. And is this person a drama queen? That's another one that really can burn you out in the workplace. And so you have to learn, I'm not interested body language, where you cross your legs, you turn the other way, you look at them that way, you don't look at them with your eyes intensely locked into their gaze, you don't want to do that. You know, you kind of put your eyes off to the side and you say, I'm so sorry you're going through this. You know, I'll think good thoughts about you while I'm back at my project, you know, good luck. You know, instead of, oh my God, tell me more, mm -hmm. which is what many empaths do because empaths are super sensitive people who tend to overgive and over listen. 
at the expense of their own selves. So when you're developing empathy, especially radical empathy, one of the key points is not to become a martyr and not to just give, give, give. So you're so exhausted all the time that you're no good for anybody or you might start getting physical symptoms or anxiety or depression uh, because you're giving too much. You know, there are many scientific studies on the power of silence to repair and regenerate the brain. And as an empath myself, silence and alone time breaks are just key to my well-being. Now, for me to go, go, go all day is just the kiss of death, really. You know, I get so exhausted and it takes me too long to recover. You know, and I don't want to give those days to recovery. But if I take the time out, I mean, you might find that too, you know, during the day where you could meditate for five minutes, there's a, a meditation I have in the book on um, just for three to five minutes, a short meditation to breathe, to center yourself, to come back to your empathic heart, or just relax, to come back to yourself and focus on something that you love. It could be a nature scene. It could be anything that relaxes you, a little puppy um, running, you know, in a country road, whatever you feel good about, to just spend some time feeling into that and reconnecting yourself with the place that you want to be. And that's a form of self-empathy to do that, to be able to give yourself gifts it's, it's hard. You, you have to ask yourself, is it hard to give myself anything? Am I a martyr? Do I just push myself and all I do is work and I'm tired and I don't watch my diet, but I, I listen to people and I work and I don't feel that well. You, you know, you, if you're listening, you just be compassionate and ask yourself these questions because my premise is that you deserve to feel well and happy, whether you're in a pandemic or not. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that if you're grieving the loss of someone that isn't extremely painful or whatever, or you've gone through COVID and you're recovering. But what I am saying is that it can be an opportunity to grow even more open hearted and have more empathy for yourself and the, the people of the world who are, we're all going through this together. And so to be able to feel some kind of camaraderie and connection, that's what we're looking for. And what empathy can give us is a feeling of connection. I'm connected to you, Susie, as we're talking, I could feel you and it's very nurturing and I feel everyone listening. And so I'm very aware of all those, that positive energy coming in as I could feel everyone who's listening. And it's not just me who can do this. If you stay open, to what all the positive that's also there. Your coworkers, you know, are creative, innovative, brilliant. Try and see that aspect of them rather than, you know, whatever is annoying you about them. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, and we can easily go down that path. Um, yeah. And I'm just, I'm curious from this work context, like as teams think about cultivating empathy among their coworkers, what are some of the, one, like what could teams do? And two, like what are some of the key benefits that we see that if you start to cultivate empathy across teams that like, you know, we can see productivity change or anything directionally that like we can start to get people to really care about this and to actually um, think about it more, make it top of mind. Well, even if you're skeptical, just try it. And what that would mean when, when a team member irritates you or you don't agree with them, try and see where they're coming from. Tell them, I see where you're coming from and I appreciate it. Um, and try not to be stuck in being right. Sometimes a form of empathy is letting other people be right and knowing that you appreciate them because bottom line, what your team is looking for is to be appreciated, to be valued and not to be put down. And so empathy can allow you to do that. And you could do an experiment. You could, let's say you're not getting along with someone on your team. You could do it the old way and just kind of withdraw and show irritation 
Um, or you can try to come from this other place where you can try and see this person is really putting an effort in. It may not be communicated well, or I may not agree with them to give them some sort of affirmation and just see what happens. You don't have to trust me with this. Just see what happens. And what I think you'll see is the person will kind of look back and go, hmm, really? You know, and, and, and then that person will shift. So even if you don't believe what I'm saying 100%, acting as if is fine. You can just act as if and just try seeing where the other person is coming from and genuinely not being attached to you being mad at them all the time and just trying something else. And what you're going to see is that people, when they start feeling appreciated and valued, are going to be more inspired, creative, productive. Then they'll come together. If you see each other as friends, not enemies, that's big. You know, you don't want to make your coworkers <laughs> into your enemies, and it's so easy to do. <laughs> it's just a human thing. You don't want to do that, though. That's not going to get you anywhere. And people have a hard time digging themselves out of these holes in the workplace where the relationships have been soured over time. You know, what I'm saying is that if you try to have empathy with somebody, if you try and see where they're coming from, if you try and even hold space for them, which is not trying to fix them. You know, one thing empaths do a lot of, which is not healthy, is trying to fix other people. You want to get in there and help and fix and you know you have your ideas about what would be good for them you don't want to do any of that you want to just hold a heart space just hold positive energy for somebody in a meeting i suggest that everybody do the three minute meditation kind of shift out of their over talking overthinking mind because the mind is useful and believe me as a psychiatrist i've had 14 years of medical training, and I love my analytic mind. I mean, I love it. But in your meetings, if you just come from your mind and logic, it's going to be cold and um, not, not as warm and inspiring as it could be. So you want to come from your mind, but you also want to come from empathy in your heart. And you can do that by just focusing on relaxing something that you love, and allowing space for somebody. Now, as a psychiatrist, what I do a lot of times is I hold the space for my patients and I listen to them. So there's empathic listening. You don't want to interrupt people. You know, they don't like that and you don't like that. So it's just something to notice. But sometimes if you get anxious, you might want to interrupt somebody because you can't bear hearing what they're saying anymore. Um, but Part of empathic listening is letting somebody finish and then you stating your point of view. Um, but giving pe the coworkers the benefit of the doubt that you do like them and you do value their participation. I value you, Suthi. I'm so happy to see you. I might not agree with you, but I'm so happy to creatively interact, you know, and, and to do that instead of, hmm, you know, I don't. I don't really agree with you, you know, and to get an attitude about it. But that's how you bring together productivity, creativity, inspiration, and plus you'll feel better at the end of the day because it takes a lot of energy to be resentful towards somebody or complain a lot or go to your coworkers and complain about this one or that one. That takes a lot of energy and life is short and you want to use your energy well. There's energy wisdom. And so empathy, it will surprise you what you're capable of doing. Um, it will reconnect you to a part of yourself that maybe you had when you were a child that's got um, stamped out of you because of the harshness of the world. But it's connecting to your intuition, that still small voice that tells you the truth about things. It's connecting to what makes you feel energized and good. You know, part of empathy is asking yourself, who do I feel good around? What coworkers would I like to be around more than others, let's say? And to gravitate towards those people, and it might even be one person, and that's good. One person is good to have one precious person that you can really relate to or, or feel good around. Mm -hmm. And it might not even be your coworkers. It might be 
you know, people who are in the environment, other people in the environment, anybody. You know, you want to connect with the positive in people and not just get drawn to what's um, what you, you have a hard time empathizing with. I'm glad you mentioned intuition too, because I think that that's something that can be a little nebulous for people. Um, and my question for you is, how do you harness and get in touch with our own inner intuition? And then how do we kind of bring that power forward with well, empathy, the work context? Yeah, empathy is a form of intuition because empathy, intuition is feeling what's going on in your environment and using those cues to guide yourself in your life. And part of feeling your environment is feeling empathically, being the emotional empath who feels into other people, and that gives you information about them. Now, when you feel into somebody and you get, maybe they're not exactly their persona that they're presenting to the world. Maybe, you know, they're feeling, you know, pain. You can get specific information with intuition. Or maybe that person just had a fight with their spouse and they're coming into work and they're really hurting, but they're being nasty instead. You know, so it gives you extra information and it, most importantly, when you develop intuition in the workplace, you must open up your gut. You know, you must listen to your gut. It's, you know, I think an issue for engineers might be that they stay up in their heads a lot rather than come back down into their body. And the thing is, if you stay up in your head, it's going to be a very painful place if that's the only place you go, because that's where suffering happens up here. A lot of it, what you do to yourself just being stuck up there, you want to also be able to listen to your gut because there's the enteric nervous system in the gut, meaning there are neurotransmitters in the gut, just like in the brain, that convey information. And you want to have that level of information at your fingertips to lead your life. It adds to your wisdom. It adds to your sense of empathy. If you're an empath and you listen to your gut, you might you know, pick up too much in your gut. It might hurt you to be around other people uh, sometimes. I don't know if you could relate to that. But at those times, it's okay to put up your shield. It's okay to back off because you don't want to absorb. You want to observe, not absorb. And that's very different. And so, you know, you want to, you know, look at what's going on with my intuition? How can it help me understand somebody better? You know, that question, you know, is so valuable, you know, and it, it, it's just an important question to ask in the workplace. You now, if you're devoted to this world changing, you could look at how it is now and how people are now in general, you know, are functioning from their lower consciousness self and they're us versus them. There's not inclusion. There's um, enemies and not, you know, and not getting along with people. And it's just not working. So we've got to make a decision at some point that we're ready for change. And as Gandhi said, to be that change. And the change requires you to be different. You can't just continue on. I mean, you could, but look at what's happening to humanity. So what I'm suggesting is a, a change you can make that may seem small, uh, but it's really huge. And it will change everything in yourself so you feel more happiness and energy. And it will change your workplace so it's more positive and inviting. So when you go on that Zoom meeting, you're going to be happy to be there. You're going to want to connect with your coworkers and not think, oh God, another Zoom meeting, you know? So it's, it makes a huge difference what I'm talking about. It does, it does. and, and one, one thing one I love thing about I in your book about tapping into intuition is really just creating that silent moment and asking yourself that question and seeing how does the body react? Because there is so much wisdom within that. And I think we, to your point, we do tend to lean on our minds way more um, when there's, yeah, there's lots of information all around us in our environments, in our bodies. Um, and I, I wanted to, just switching gears a, a little bit from this is, is more around the question of what tips do you have for us to set emotional boundaries at work and at home? I think that there's such an interesting blend now that's happening in the middle of the pandemic for some of us 
And so, yeah, what are your, what's your advice there? Um, yes, just to be um, very careful that you're venting and not dumping, as there's a difference. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, dumping is when you just feel trauma or you feel upset and there's your loving coworker and it just blurts out and you just take them by surprise or they take you by surprise and suddenly you're standing there with all this emotional stuff coming at you and you're not ready for it. So you don't want to do that. But venting often is appropriate expression of feelings where you actually make an appointment with somebody. You say, is now a good time for me to express my feelings? You know, or is tomorrow morning better? And this is true at home, at the workplace. But you don't want to surprise your uh, coworkers with a whole lot of emotions when they're not prepared for it. And so to be able to set that limit, so to avoid, it's called trauma dumping, um, I was just interviewed by USA Today on this topic because it's so big now in the workplace where people are feeling a lot of trauma and that's understandable. But you know how you express that is, is important too to your coworkers. So having that empathic awareness you know, is, is really important. And so you wanna be able to set the boundaries and learn that no is a complete sentence. No, I'm not available right now. No, I'm sorry, I can't listen for two hours. I'm so tired after a long day, but I can listen for five minutes. So you have to learn how to set limits with time um, and tell people from the beginning if they start up, you know, I got five minutes and um, I'll, I'm listening with all my attention and then I gotta go. So, but it's the tone of voice that you set emotional boundaries. If I hope you notice the tone that I I used. It's very matter of fact. It's very love. Yeah, even it's not, oh my God, you can't talk like that for, you know, ongoing. You're going to drain me. I'm going to be a wreck after this. You don't want to say anything like that, but you feel it. I'm not saying to emotionally bypass your own feelings inwardly. You say, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to handle this. But then you say to yourself, yes, I can. I can set this boundary with this tone of voice short and sweet. You don't want to get into confrontations with people. Not good. You don't want to get into long conversations, making up reasons why you're entitled to say no. You know, none of that. What is your advice for how to tell people or how they can say no? I think in this state, we feel a lot of guilt. We feel like we have to be doing all these things. And given the fact that a lot of people are experiencing similar a similar moment in time. So how do people say no in a way that is true to them? Um, it just realize everybody is feeling this and respecting somebody's energy is one of the most um, honoring things that you can do. So to be aware of not putting too much on other people all at once. You know, I always encourage people to just discuss one issue at a time. Don't do 10 at once. That's nobody can handle that right now. That's too much, but you need to prioritize. Now let's say a workplace issue and let's say you want to discuss it with your team. I don't know if you ever do that, but you know, if, if one person, you know, has, has an issue they'd like to discuss or, or with an individual, you know, to say, I'd, li I'd like to talk about this issue at work. I don't feel like, you know, I'm getting enough time or attention with this project or whatever the issue is, but to pick one so you don't overload people. And um, that's often more doable than trying to pinpoint a bunch of issues at once. So one at a time, and I know you have a lot of issues and in this, this period of time, this last year and a half, there has been a lot of trauma. There's a lot of depression, isolation, uncertainty. Um, but I've also seen a lot of creation and innovation and new ways of relating to each other. And that's what I would focus on. And for those who are hurting, um, to have empathy, you know, and to just say, I know it hurts now. It's a hard time. You know, I'm with you. I'm right there with you. But you can say that and not get into the details. Because you don't want to necessarily know what's going on with their spouse at home. You know, that's a little too much at work. At work is work. You know, you hopefully you have, you know, at least one person who's a friend who you can talk to or a therapist or a guide or a coach 
who, you know, who can support you on that level. Um, but at work, the key thing is to have empathy for your coworkers, to not judge them so harshly, you know, and for self-empathy, to give yourself the benefit of the doubt. You know, let's say you've made a mistake. Let's say you didn't talk to somebody the way you'd like to talk to them. That's okay. And so you can always go back, you know, and say, I'm sorry, I wish, you know, I, I really respect you. I'm sorry I spoke to you with a snippy tone. You know, you can always go back to that and give yourself the benefit of the doubt. You know, again, self-empathy is about beating yourself up a little bit less each day. Yeah. You know, and that's fine. That's enough. I'm a big believer in small changes. I'm not a big believer in these instant transformations. Just little by little, like the turtle, you want to move forward and set boundaries. If you're an empath, if you're a highly sensitive person, um, to be able to set boundaries with other people in terms of emotional boundaries, how much time and energy you have to give to something, and to say no, no is a complete sentence, or no thank you. You know, I, I don't really feel I want to be involved with that project. It doesn't resonate with me. You know, and at work, in innovation, using your empathy to really find the projects that set you on fire, if that's possible, if you have that option. If something really isn't doing it for you, you probably won't be the, as useful as you could be. Um, so if you do have any control over that, you know, to choose projects where you're on fire and trying to see that it's not your job to take on the suffering of the world. Now, when you're at work, you want to be 100% present at work, empathizing with your employees, listening to your intuition, and, and not going to the news, you know, or not going to the internet to just get caught up. Because that will take away your focus at work. You can do that later if you want, but not in an addictive way because it will bring you down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a powerlessness about that and you don't want to be sucked into the vortex of suffering that is going on now. Um, you want to be at work, you know, and I just want to say it's it, if you can see your role as that is not taking on the suffering of the world, which it isn't, that isn't your role. Your role is to deal with yourself and your loved ones and your immediate environment. Um, just keep that in mind. And empaths, that's very hard because they go around in the world and navigate feeling everybody's suffering. They go through a tent community, feel all that suffering. They feel everybody who's hurting. They listen to them too much. We have to stay in our own lanes. We have to be very discerning about where we give our energy and what we think about. Because if you let your mind overthink you know, all the negativity and darkness in the world, it will take you off your purpose. You know, and at work, you have a tremendous purpose and you need to stay true to that. And that will require the downtime break. That will require the meditative time and the breathing and also getting out in nature. Um, I know when I was at the Google campus here in um, LA, you know, they have surfboards there for people yeah, to go. <laughs> She goes surfing, which is so incredible. It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I, I'm oh, sorry. sorry. I think I actually, think actually dude, could you turn on your mic just a little bit? I just hear myself. Hear myself. Oh, your oh, speaker. Could you turn your speaker down just a little bit? Okay. How's that? Perfect. Right. Um, I, uh, I want to, I see there's a, a tons of questions that have come in too. And I want to make sure that we give them the opportunity to ask you a few questions. So um, we have one from Susanna. She says, how do you react when other people don't understand or respect your boundaries and you don't want to keep explaining why you have specific boundaries or needs? Uh, well, you know, Susanna, you do have to sometimes remind people um, to re-educate them, especially if you've been in a a pattern with them where they're used to trespassing your boundaries and especially with with family members and you do it lightly and you do it hey you know this is this is how i feel this is my boundary again and i love you you know or or and say something positive with it but i would you know experiment more with repetition but sometimes you do need to do that um and and i've got to say there's some people who don't ever respect your boundaries i mean i, I had a mother who 
No, I kept telling her, don't call me after 10 o'clock at night. And she kept doing it until the, till the last time. So I never successful with her on that boundary. So, you know, with those kind of people, you either roll with it or you just limit contact. But uh, with, with most people though, and you have to educate friends, you know, say, hey, I'm just not available for two hours at the end of the day anymore. I just, you know, I'm trying to practice self care. So just be a little more patient with people if you're trying to reset boundaries with them. And the ones that can't respect your boundaries, then you have to decide you know, how much contact you want to have with them or need to have with them. That's fair. See. So this Googler engineer said, isn't it better to detach from a person if empathizing the person whom you disagree who disagree, whom you disagrees to eternity affects your negativity, for example, performance and happiness. Um, sure, you could deal with it that way. But what I, I'm surprised, what I'm suggesting, um, because you probably think about this person too much, you don't want this person, you know, taking paying rent in your brain. And so the the um, positive aspects of empathizing with this person, you could disagree with them, they, you know, totally to eternity is to try the namaste, you know, not force yourself to do it, but just even just try it, act your act as if, say, I respect the spirit within you, I don't agree with you, I respect the spirit within you. And, you know, perhaps even empathize with their suffering, or their, maybe they have a history of abuse that's causing them to act in this way, or maybe they're just horribly rigid and frightened. You know, there's always, if you take the time to look, there's always something there that you could find. Um, but you don't have to do that. And one thing I talk about in the book are emotional triggers as a, as a block to empathy, because if somebody really triggers you, or in my life, if somebody really triggers me, the first thing I ask is, you know, what do I need to heal in myself? Does this person remind me of my mother or my father or another person who was able to get me? You know, like people being very opinionated used to be a, a real trigger for me. You know, I have a friend, she's 93 now, and she's just as opinionated as she's always been. But now I can say to her, you know, it looks like you really, you know, believe this. And she goes, I do, I do. So I, I give it to her, you know, I let her be right. And she loves it. She's gleeful. So there are all kinds of other ways to deal with this person. But if you're experiencing a lot of negativity, if they have the power to get you in that way, I would say to gently look inside yourself and see if they remind you of anybody and begin to, to heal that in yourself. Because when you're not as triggerable, the person can still be annoying, but it's not like the knife in the gut. It's a different situation. Hope that helps. Yes. And um, Sandeep says, Paul Bloom's book, Against Sympathy, argues that empathy is a poor predictor of moral goodness, political affiliation, and worldview. He makes a case for rational compassion for decisions. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I'm aware of Paul Bloom's book. Um, and I don't really have the same definition of empathy as Paul Bloom does it because I use empathy along with the discerning rational mind to make decisions. It's not either or. It's not like you're giving up your your discerning rational mind. You could have empathy for you know a, anybody really if you allow yourself to have empathy with them, but that doesn't mean you're going to make them your best friend. You know, it doesn't mean you're not going to set a boundary with them. So I encourage you to use all your reason and all of your analytic mind along with your heart. You can work together. I've seen these beautiful, fun pictures of the mind and the heart holding hands. I love that, you know. So know that you're multifaceted. You can use both. It's not just, oh, I feel empathy. I feel sorry for this perpetrator, so I'm going to just forgive them. Not at all. You don't lose your rational judgment. That isn't what happens. That's if you only feel empathy and you don't engage the mind, you might, that might happen to you, but you don't want that to happen to you. You want to use up here and here. You want to use all your perceptual abilities at work and everywhere. You don't want to cut off anything. Yeah. Great answer. 
So we have Alicia says, what methods or techniques would you suggest for an empath to employ to replete themselves after dealing with an extremely stressful day with colleagues or sitting in a toxic virtual space for some time? It's a good question. Yes, drink a lot of water. Um, take breaks where you, breathing breaks where you go outside, don't just stay inside, go outside and breathe the fresh air. Take a look, you know, if you if you have nature accessible to get out in nature and be rejuvenated by that. Um, and during those toxic meetings, um, to begin to employ perhaps, you know, what I'm talking about, you know, in saying, all right, I'm in a toxic meeting, how can I have empathy for this person? And even though I'm in a toxic meeting, whatever that toxicity is, and say, oh, okay, maybe this person seems really defensive. You can play like a game with yourself to try and shift your perspective in a negative environment. And perhaps you might want to give that toxic person the ability to be right and see what happens to that toxic person. You know, seeing if they turn around, seeing if you can take them by surprise. There's a, a wonderful book I love by Sung Ten called The Art of War. And he said, if you ever have to go into battle with somebody, that's the supreme disappointment. That's a supreme failure. You want to try and deal with the situation before that, to try and shift it in your favor when you see an opponent. And trying to have empathy, trying to uh, shift the toxic, toxic interaction it does it has amazing effects, but you don't want to do it. You're you're in the I'm in a toxic, toxic meeting. Oh, well, okay, you're in a toxic meeting. How can I shift it? That's what radical empathy is. It's being the hero or the heroine. It's like I'm not going to just say this is a toxic meeting and leaving it leaving it at that. I'm going to try and shift the energy by trying to feel for that toxic person. You know, I kind of dare you to do it because it be. <laughs> you just have to see what I'm talking about you know, come back to me that, but you, you have to see this. So I encourage you to play with your interactions so they're not as miserable for you. As when you see them in a certain way, all the good reasons to label it as toxic. And believe me, I know you have your good reasons, but we're at an evolutionary shift in our society. Now you can either continue to do it the old way, or you can summon what is best in your human nature and everybody has it and the ego will fight you. But what I'm asking you to do is to be the change you want to see. And this is a way to do it. And you start in your workplace, you start in your one to ones, you start with your friends, you know, you, you, you start with what you got and you, this is a shift in yourself and it, it's incredible healing that can happen with this because your world suddenly opens up. You're not just trying to deal with everything with your mind. You're expanding. And even, you know, if you do, if you are open to a spiritual higher power to just inwardly request that I come from my larger self here and I'm not just stuck in my mind. And even if you think you don't have a larger self, just ask for it and see what you feel. You know, just look up at the universe look up at the stars and the sky and see how small we are in this enormous mystery keep that in mind when you're in your toxic environment you know that will help you see have mercy on other human beings and have mercy on yourself it's hard to be human there's a lot of challenges that we all go through and sometimes you can't see that in another person it's not readily obvious but it's there and I tell you, as a psychiatrist, that that pain, that suffering is there. Happy people don't act in, you know, ways that will hurt you. And they don't act in narcissistic or attack mode or none of that. They don't act that way. Happy people sit back and smile and try and see your point of view. You know, I want to see your point of view, may not agree with you, want to see it because I respect you as a human being. And that respect that I have for you, Susie, that I have for everyone out here, that sets a tone. It's not like you're my enemy and you have to prove yourself. I have respect for you. So 
you just try that. These are all forms of radical empathy, but it's a new way of thinking and doing. And, and sometimes you just have to try it out to see if it works. But I'm really interested in results. I'm not interested in theory. And this works. So I present it to you as, as an opportunity for empaths, highly sensitive person, and all those with cognitive empathy who prefer staying in their minds. Everybody try this and just see the results for yourself. Yeah, to experience is to know. And um, Judith, I know we're, we're right at time and I just wanna kind of give the final minute to you. Anything else you want to, to say to close us out? Um, just that it's been a joy to present at Google again. And thank you to Susie so much for being a wonderful moderator. And if anyone wants to um, get in touch with me or find out more about the Empath Survival Guide or Radical Empathy, you can go to drjudithorloff.com, which is my website. And I just encourage everybody, give this a try. Have some fun with it. Lighten up. Um, and enjoy. Enjoy this. This will give you a sense of empowerment in your workplace. Well, thank you so much, Judith. Thank you very much.